We're everything but rooftops here, pretty much, except really brownfields, which is our next session. Uh, brownfields could be everything. And so if you do have a traditional brownfield redevelopment project of some kind on your property, dealing with vertical development, and you've got solar panels on top, it, it very well might qualify for the brown, bright field points in the e US EPA bright field, a brownfield program. But I'm stealing the thunder <laughs> from our brownfield stars uh, representing the states of Virginia and our national government, who I see, I see Mead popping in. Let me welcome into the chat, Patricia Obermeyer as well. And yeah. Mead, I think you're gonna uh, start us off um, with a view from uh, what you, all the programs you guys have um, there at DEQ in Virginia. And then we'll get to Ms. Patricia Obermeyer from the Office of Brownfield Land Revitalization at, at US EPA. Uh, so with that, I'll take it away. Thank you, Dan. Um... We're going to take a couple of steps back and, and talk about, you know, uh, Brownfields 101, helping people understand the fundamentals of Brownfields and, and just the basics. And, and there are some people that are experts on the call today, and there's other people that this is a new concept to them. But uh, first, I thought that we would uh, kind of take a quick poll in a way. How many people are out here are consultants? And, and get your hand on your mouse and hit your uh, raise your hand button. And, and just to get an idea, you know, do we have a lot of consultants? So if, if you're a consultant, feel free to raise your hand. Um, They're rolling in, Mead. Okay. Looks like we're hovering right at 12 consultants. And how many are developers? Solar developers or a developer of some type? We've got 10. That's good. How about attorneys? I hate to bring it up, but how many, how many lawyers do we have? We need some. Ah, uh, only two. Oh, uh, they got the cookie corner. Now they're shy. Um, I'm a retired attorney. I didn't raise my <laughs> hand. <laughs> uh, how many local or county government people have we uh, gotten to join us today? Four, five, still ticking up a little bit. How many people from state government? And that's any state, right? I mean, I know sure. folks from we'll, we'll let other states join us. Dan did. <laughs> yeah, we have some international friends joining us today. Everybody wants to do this work. It's like about 11 on the state government answer. And how about federal government? Patricia, are you the only one? That can't be. Folks are shy, and we have more folks watching on YouTube. Who I'm, I'm sorry, you can't raise your hands, but uh, I know we have a diverse audience today. And, and how many people joined just because the conference was free and they wanted to learn? Shooting up here. <laughs> free is good. Thank you, sponsors. <laughs> yes, we can thank them. Okay, well, that's kind of helpful and interesting. And uh, I'll go ahead and jump right on in and, and uh, get into my slides here and uh, teach about the fundamentals of, of Brownfields 101. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, you know, some of the takeaway points are going to be what is a Brownfields? Please write down uh, my contact uh, information that's at the end of my slide presentation and also uh, Vince's. And, and if you have questions, reach out to us, give us a call 
and, and let us help you uh, walk through a brownfields issues that you might have on a site. And, and you're gonna find this is gonna be a theme through today, particularly for our work. Uh, when you run into situations on properties, uh, you know, it's best to talk it out and try to figure out what are the issues there and how to, how to work through them. Realize that these issues can be fixed and that using a brownfield for alternative energy, as we've already talked about, is an excellent choice due to low uh, potential exposure from contaminants, due to zoning, and a variety of other issues that we've got out there. Next slide, please. What is a brownfield? Uh, it, and this is the definition from the Virginia State Code, but it's very similar on the federal level and also similar in other states. And it's real property, the expansion, redevelopment, or reuse, which might be complicated by the presence or potential presence of a hazardous substance, pollutant, or contaminant. So you can see that even the fact that you might have something out there can qualify it as a brownfield. Um, and this includes industrial sites, landfills, previously li mined lands, which are all very applicable to, to um, solar redevelopments, as well as Main Street buildings, uh, some railroad lines, uh, and, and so many other sites out there. Next, please. What I also like to point out in a presentation is that Virginia in 2002 adopted a Brownfields Restoration and Land Renewal Policy and programs. And uh, this is something Virginia doesn't do on that for that many programs out there. There's only a few policies in the environmental arena, and this is one of them. And it should be our policy to encourage remediation and restoration of brownfields by removing barriers and providing incentives and insistence whenever possible. And this is what we try to do at DEQ. And we're, we work very closely with the Economic Development Partnership and other agencies too, to establish policies and programs to implement these policies, such as the Voluntary Remediation Program, which we're gonna talk about, Brownfields Restoration and Redevelopment Fund, which we touch on also. And we've already heard just a little bit about that. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, looking at brownfields from an, another angle, it's really environmental cleanup and economic development added up equal rules. These two go together to revitalize property, whether it's a, a solar field or whether it's a town in your uh, Main Street area. Next slide. Typical redevelopments that you see are old buildings that or industries that are out there, gas stations, and uh, you're hoping to get something better out of the deal to get them back onto the tax rolls. Next slide. And what you wanna see are parks, uh, educational centers, and solar fields, as you can see at the very bottom. Next slide, please. Why would you want to go into the voluntary remediation program and work with brownfields? Well, it helps you understand these environmental conditions out there. It helps you to resolve environmental concerns out there and legacy issues that have been there and have put a stigma on the property itself. Uh, often you have lenders that don't wanna lend on these properties because of the environmental concerns. You have neighborhoods that are concerned. Uh, and you have liability when you do buy them, but with the uh, appropriate steps, you can reduce that liability for the purchase of that property and the ownership of it and for the resale of it. Uh, engaging with the Brownfields program and it helps to uh, promote in community engagement. We've talked about that earlier today. And also the possibility of, of state and federal grants and not taking the right steps as you walk through property purchases can preclude you from getting grants, particularly uh, the grants that are eligible uh, to uh, local governments. And you're gonna hear more about those grants later. And there's a link to our web pages. Next slide, please. Uh, Virginia also passed a very high tax exemption uh, in 1997. And it's been uh, underutilized, I'd say, by local government. But for sites that are enrolled in the voluntary re remediation program, 
they can be considered a separate class of property and the taxes, uh, the real estate taxes can actually be frozen on those properties for up to five years. So that if you had a million dollar piece of property, you could freeze that tax at a million dollars, you could redo uh, and redevelop the building itself and the local government would only tax you on that first million to offset the cleanup costs that would go with uh, redeveloping that old factory site. We've, we've seen it used very successfully in a few counties out there. Rockbridge probably did one of the best uh, uh, examples of implementing this policy and uh, getting a, a de tax delinquent piece of property back on, on the tax rolls and, and reused. So, you renew that on a, on a yearly basis for five years. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Virginia Brownfields R Restoration and Economic Development Assistance Fund, we call it VBAF for short, it's available to government entities in Virginia. Uh, we have been getting 2.25 million budgeted for the last few years each year. Uh, it's been a very powerful tool for local government to revitalize property that's within their uh, jurisdictions. So far, we've granted out 118 assessment and planning grants with a maximum of $50,000, 22 remediation grants up to half a million dollars. Uh, the remediation grants are competitive and are, are typically due during uh, the fall around November 1 of each year. Due to the pandemic, uh, we have an April 1 deadline uh, of this year, of 2021. So these are open right now. There's about two weeks left to get your application together for these competitive grants. The assessment and planning grants are available on a rolling basis, and uh, we still have funds left in this year. So if you have something, reach out to us and talk to us about it. Uh, to date, we've granted out over $10 million in Virginia. It's a really powerful tool. Uh, it does require a one-to-one -one match, but we work closely with the EPA grants, and uh, which can often serve as that match. Other grants can be used also. And we try to be as flexible as possible uh, for these grants because we realize that it, at times when a, when a city is trying to deal with a, uh, an abandoned piece of property, they have no money in it at that time for a match and they're trying to figure out how to get that piece uh, fixed, how to get that puzzle fixed and, and back into uh, productive use in their town. There's the link. Uh, for the Economic Development Partnership, where you can find applications and further information and guidance. Next slide, please. A little bit of an overview of where our grants have gone across Virginia. As you can see, they're pretty well distributed. Uh, next slide, please. Later, you're gonna hear more about the EPA Brownfields grants. We work very closely with uh, Region 3 staff and Patricia also. Uh, and these are uh, various types of assessment and cleanup grants. You're going to hear more about that from Patricia in just a little bit. Next slide. To give you an idea of the distribution, because there is quite a bit of overlap, the people that are successful with uh, EPA grants are successful with uh, VBAF grants, and they couple them, as you can see, with the overlap right there. Next slide, please. Um, EPA does have different types of assistance out there. The targeted brownfields assessment, you're gonna hear a little bit about this, but this is another powerful tool to, from the EPA to get assessments done in communities out there. Next slide. Uh, TAB assistance, you, you have TBA assistance and TAB, you know, acronyms all the way, but this is uh, done through New Jersey Institute of Technology. Gary White's gonna be with us a little bit later to talk about that and we work closely with those folks too. Thank you, next slide. Uh, you know, we're committed to getting these brownfields redeveloped, whether it's a solar field or a community uh, or a, a Main Street property to get them back into use. We offer brownfields individualized outreach to communities where we'll come out and talk to you about how to uh, position the site for redevelopment and reuse. And you know we just flat out enjoy doing this. We want to help coordinate and work through regulatory issues and help you get an understanding of, of what needs to be done out there. Next slide. Typical redevelopments within towns, Pulaski. Next slide. 
you're kind of abandoned factories and, and underutilized properties. Next slide. And this is what you can get when you team together and work through grants and, and get a private developer into the property, the Jackson Park Inn. If you haven't stayed there, you should. We held a conference there about three years ago and everybody thoroughly enjoyed it. Next slide, please. Uh, solar, we worked with the town of Bedford on this solar project. It was in the uh, buffer zone to an old landfill that had contamination within the groundwater. And uh, I think it was a great success. Next slide. We do comfort letters for pre-purchase of brownfields. And uh, it's, uh, it, you do your phase ones according to, you know, uh, ASTM standards. It's important to do that and uh, to understand the properties that you're purchasing. Uh, the BFPP letters, the lender liability letters, the lender liability, I mean the BFPP for tenants, excuse me, and the contiguous property owner letters. These are all available through DEQ and you can contact us uh, about how to work through those and get applications for them. Next slide. Uh, DEQ has a voluntary remediation program that it was developed in 1995 and the regulations were passed in 97. We've revised those several times to keep up with the uh, changing industry. Uh, uh, the, the, the VRP offers a way to meet the appropriate care requirements of the Brownfield statutes. So by appropriate care, you know, I like to describe it as don't put the daycare on top of the uh, Brownfield. But if you do the right steps, you can develop things like recreational reuse uh, of the properties on highly contaminated sites. But you really need to step through the, uh, a program to get that uh, team that DEQ has to redevelop these properties. And we've done this on examples like Longbridge Park up in Northern Virginia. Uh, the, some of the important things of completing uh, a VRP project on one of these properties is, in the, is the enforcement immunity that comes when the cleanup is complete. And that's under state law. The next step is we have a memorandum of agreement with EPA. So when you complete a site in Virginia, there's no further federal interest in that property. So this uh, provides that enforcement immunity that the lawyers like so much and that the banks feel is so important on, when lending on properties. If you want to get more information on this, you can reach out to us once again. And there's a link to our, our BRP website. Next step or next program, excuse me. Um, eight years ago, we partnered up with our solid waste uh, uh, division and uh, I gave a presentation about reusing uh, old landfills and uh, trying to get solar on them. And I think we've really come a long ways in eight years from me uh, speaking and having some skeptical people out there to, to actual whole conferences on this. So uh, keep these questions in mind as we go through the next couple of days because we're going to dive deeper into landfills we're going to talk about reusing these properties and engaging localities on their historic landfills. Next slide. You know, the, the old solar technology was closed pins. We're really jumping uh, light years ahead. So stay tuned. You're really going to find some interesting, uh, interesting information over the next couple of days. And the next slide is contact information. And I'll let Patricia take it over because she's got some really good information uh, on the EPA and some of their programs. Thank you. Thanks, Mead. Thank you, Mead. Thank you, Patricia. Yes, thanks, everyone. Thanks to Dan and Carrie and everybody um, at the Virginia Solar um, Summit for inviting me. So um, you've heard a lot from Mead about what Virginia has to offer. She's one of our, our best students. So great program and great partners. So I want to give you a little bit of an overview of what resources we also have available at the federal level. So why don't we go to the next slide, please? So basically, EPA has resources to help you um, with brownfields, put them in the solar projects, put them in whatever project that uh, the community needs. And a lot of our resources mirror the state resources, but it doesn't mean that you can't take advantage of both. You can marry the programs, partner the programs, take advantage of all the resources that um, are available to you. So at the federal level, we, also, we have grants and technical assistance that can help each community, each nonprofit, 
um, in planning, assessing, cleaning up, and reusing your brownfields. We have grants to enhance our uh, job training programs in your community. We have what we call the Environmental Workforce Development Job Training Program, which I'll talk a little bit about later. But in addition to our grants, we also, as Mead said, we also have um, liability protections at the federal level um, under the federal Superfund law, the uh, Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. That's what we call Superfund or CERCLA. But CERCLA does provide since 2002 protections for folks who are willing to uh, enter, to purchase these properties, to purchase brownfield properties, or at this point, enter into long-term leases on the properties. So we can help with that, with technical assistance, with comfort letters, um, et cetera. Also, as we pointed out, a very important piece of the liability protections is if you enter your site into a state voluntary cleanup program and get that no further action assurance letter from your state, EPA is not going to overfile. It's a, um, a very good option for everyone to take their brownfield. So you're protected from EPA enforcement if the state, in fact, uh, gives you that no further action. So that's a great program. Um, also, we also at the federal level um, provide money to state, to state and tribal programs. We give me money each year to help run his program. So great partnership um, and great resources all around. Next slide. Slide, please. So just a little bit, um, you know, think about the, the whole cycle. We're here to help you with the entire cycle, both need and um, our federal resources with the EPA Brownfields Program and the state Brownfields programs. But um, think about, you know, once you have a property, you need to assess it and characterize it. You want to figure out what's potentially uh, there. Um, remember that a lot of brownfields just look bad. Because of that broad definition of a brownfield, you know, the potential contamination, it, you know, this, these sites are complicated a lot of times because they look awful. Just looking awful doesn't make you, you know, a bad thing. You can look awful and still have a lot of potential. Um, so what we want to do is encourage folks to use our resources um, to assess and characterize the site, make sure it's contaminated, and also make sure you can delineate, delineate what kinds of contamination you have and what's the extent of that contamination. And then once in, in conjunction with your characterization of the contamination, who's liable for that contamination? Make sure you don't walk into a, a property, you know, not knowing it's contaminated, but then also once you do know it's contaminated, who's responsible and how can you make sure that you as the new owner, the new EC, that you're not the liable party. So we have resources to help you with that. We have folks to help you with that. So, um, please uh, take advantage of our resources. Let us help you figure these things out. Um, also then once you either before, during, or after you've delineated the liability, you make those decisions whether to purchase or lease these properties. Um, with, in the case of solar, it might be a lease, a long-term lease, but under the federal uh, scheme now under CERCLA, if you're a long-term leasee, we can treat you as a purchaser for liability purposes, so very important. And then, you know, once you've figured out who's liable, what the assessment is there, figure out, you know, how to clean, how to clean up the property to the point where you can use it for its intended reuse. And one note about reuse at the federal level, um, probably even at the state level, we do not try to dictate reuse. So reuse is a local decision. It's a property owner decision and it's a local community decision. We want to support all reuses. Um, with our federal programs and our federal resources. So all of our resources are available regardless of what the community and or the property owner wants in form of reuse. But we want the reuse to be locally driven, to be property specific. And but we also in our program want to help you and want to promote sustainable reuse. We don't want today's brownfields to be tomorrow's brownfields. We want today's brownfields to be economic drivers for your community. We don't want to end up having you come back 10 years from now and say, hey, we just created a, another brownfield. So we wanna make them so that they're you know, sustainably reused, they're revitalization and they're real economic drivers for the community. Next slide, please. So um, this is gonna sound like a repeat of everything that me almost said almost. So at the federal level, we have assessment grants, cleanup grants, grants to 
um, capitalized revolving loan funds to promote cleanup of brownfields. We have multi-purpose grants, which are just one grant to do both assessment and cleanup. And we also have grants to support environmental workforce and job training programs. Next slide, please. Who's eligible for federal brownfields grants? Any form of government, state, tribe, local, regional uh, uh, governments, and also a nonprofit. Non any nonprofit that will fit within the um, 5013C definition set forth by our IRS. Next slide, please. So all these folks are eligible to do all these wonderful things. So Brownfields assessment grants, basically an assessment grant can be used to inventory sites in your communities, to characterize those sites, to do assessments, to do your, what we call all appropriate inquiries under CERCLA, but it's also your phase one environmental site assessment under the ASTM E1527. If you don't know what that means, consult your, your local engineer, your environmental professional, and they'll help you out. Basically, it's your phase one environmental assessment um, and your characterization of these properties can be done with our assessment grants. You can also do a lot of planning activities with our assessment grants. And it's important when you're assessing and characterizing your site, you're determining what, the, what kind of contamination may be there, what could be the extent of the contamination. Um, also, you want to start planning, but what are you gonna do with that property? Because what your reuse is means a lot towards how you're gonna clean that up, how far you're gonna go with the cleanup, and where you end up with cleanup, Austin, it has to be married with the, the reuse that you're gonna use. Um, we can also use our funding to do community involvement, and you must do community involvement when you have our grants. Our grants dictate that the community be involved in the decisions that are being made with community properties. And um, again, all of these, the multi-purpose aspect of of our grants, assessment grants, inventory, characterize, assess, plan for cleanup, do your public involvement, inform and engage your stakeholders. Next slide, please. So there are all kinds of brownfields assessment grants. So basically, you can have a community-wide assessment grant, which basically when you apply for a pot of money, um, uh, funding, and then you determine which asset, which uh, Brownfields in your community, you need to assess after you get the grant. You can also do a site specific assessment grant. You may have in your community um, or your nonprofit may own a, a very important site to your community, one site which you really need to concentrate assessment resources on. And so you can apply for a site assessment, a site specific assessment grant. We also can do and provide uh, assessment coalition grants. But basically, if there's a coalition of communities that want to come in together and, and, and share uh, uh, funds to do assessments throughout their communities, you definitely can do that. You just need, need to make sure that one of those communities, one of the entities within the coalition is going to be the responsible um, party to uh, manage the grant. And then we also have multi-purpose grants. Um, multi-purpose grants, um, you can apply for up to $800,000 and then you can do assessments and cleanups with one um, pot of funding or one grant. Next slide, please. Then Brownfield's cleanup grants. So after you do the assessment, you wanna do the cleanup, you can apply for our cleanup grants to do the cleanup. So we have, and cleanup includes all aspects of cleanup, uh, planning for the cleanup, doing the cleanup, analyzing the cleanup, et cetera. So we have brownfields uh, cleanup grants. There are some conditions in our cleanup grants. One is that you have to own the entity that applies for the grant has to own the property. Uh, you can't be liable for the contamination of the property and there is a 20% cost share. We also provide um, capitalization for revolving money funds. Basically if a community has several properties that need to be cleaned up and they want to come in and ask us for up to, uh, I think, $800,000 to put into a fund. And then you can loan out those uh, funds to others in your community to do the cleanup. Then the folks who you loan the money to pays it back to the fund and then you can loan it out again to another um, a brownfield owner, uh, property owner. So that's a way to get uh, more resources into your community and generate some income that can then be put back out for more great brownfields cleanup. 
And then again, we have multi-purpose grants, uh, as I said before. Next slide, please. Uh, we did this. Next slide, please. So again, a little bit about multi-purpose funding. We don't do a lot of these grants because they are um, big in the resource parade here, up to $800,000. I think we even have authority to do up to a million dollars, but that's a lot of money for us to put into a community. And so we really think hard about awarding a multi-purpose grant. We need someone to be ready to both assess clean up and, and do uh, revitalization planning. So you need to be able to do all three aspects, get on the ground running as soon as you have one of these grants. If you're not ready to do clean up and you're not ready to do revitalization, just apply for an assessment grant because we really, really um, favor these resources to folks who can show us that they can do all three prongs within a five-year grant. If you can't, Remember, these resources will then be available to someone who can meet uh, those conditions. But they are available, and if you are ready in all aspects with different properties to assess them different and clean them up and do revitalization, this is a good opportunity for your community. Next slide, please. And this is one of my favorite programs in the EPA um, SLU uh, available. Uh, grant programs, the environmental workforce and development and job training program that we have. Uh, basically, this is able to, to help and to support uh, job training programs in, in your community. If you, so we uh, provide grants to job training programs so that they can add curriculum uh, that includes environmental uh, trainings and environmental trainings in how to do hazardous and solid waste. Uh, cleanups, how to do brownfields assessment, how to do emergency response, wastewater and stormwater, but also we've had several grantees that have used these funds to add to their training programs solar panel installations. So this is a really good match for um, solar folks. The, um, one thing to remember that if you apply for these grants, these are really powerful. These are making differences in people's lives, putting people in programs that train them to then work in their communities and do great things. Um, but just remember, one thing that we do ask of our applicants when they come in is that they have agreements with employers because we want to employ people with these grants. So please, um, if you're thinking about this powerful grant, wonderful program, but we want you to come in as an applicant and say, I have a job training program. I'm going to use these funds to train people in my community. And I have agreements for um, employers in my community to employ my graduates. Next slide, please. Okay, a little bit of um, everything I talked about um, so far, and the most part was uh, authorities that were provided to EPA, to the EPA Brownfields Program as a result of the 2002 amendments to CERCLA. But I don't want to be remiss and not mention that 2018, we did have additional amendments and they have powerful things. But, um, powerful amendments to our program that really can help, particularly with the solar panel installation and the reuse of brownfields for solar for solar um, or other um, renewable um, energy. So basically in 2018, uh, CERCLA was amended, reauthorized our program and clarified different liability uh, provisions for state and local governments, made it easier for state and local governments to be outside the liability scheme. So um, once you're outside the liability scheme, you can use our funds. So basically there is a prohibition in the statute that says once you all, any brownfields funding has to be, can be used for brownfields cleanup and redevelopment, but you cannot use our funds if you're the responsible party. So the more ways that we can break down that liability um, provisions for state and local governments, the more powerful our grants are. But also with the 2008 um, Build Act, um, the Congress expanded the bona fide prospective purchaser protection to long-term lease fees. So basically now solar developers who aren't going to buy the properties but are entering into long-term lease leases, they can um, avail themselves of the bona fide prospective purchaser protection. Of course, they have to comply with all of the, the conditions to be a BFPP, but it's there and I think it's, it's powerful for certain reuse options. So take note of that. Um, 
Also, another really important thing that Congress um, decided to do with the um, Build Act amendments was they added an additional ranking criteria. So when you apply for a Brownfields grant, we evaluate your grant against certain ranking criteria, which we did not make up. The program did not make up our evaluation criteria. Congress put them right in the legislation. And in 2018, they um, had an epiphany, I guess, and thought, you know, reusable, sustainable energy is really important in the Brownfields realm. So basically, um, now when you apply for a Brownfields grant, you can get points in the evaluation if you can show us that your brownfields reuse will be focused on renewable energy or energy efficiency projects. So great, great call on Congress and uh, you know, let's get out there and make solar happen. Next slide, please. Here's some grant summaries. We just recently, um, on March 11th, we announced um, 18 applicants that got our Environmental Workforce Development and Job Training Grants. In April, we'll be uh, announcing the availability of supplemental funding for our current um, Brownfields Revolving Loan Fund grantees. And then in May, um, each May, we announce um, the applicants that are uh, selected for our Assessment Cleanup for Multipurpose Grants. And one note about Assessment Cleanup and Multipurpose Grants, if you're thinking, oh no, I missed it this year, don't worry, come September, the uh, guidelines for new applications will be out on the street. So um, become educated on uh, the application process now so that you're ready in September to apply for a grant. Next slide, please. Okay, just basically, so next slide. A little bit about technical systems, but we pretty much covered this. We do have, we do provide funding to um, nonprofit uh, groups uh, for Region 3, Virginia, UK Region 3, Virginia, that's the New Jersey um, Institute of Technology. Basically, they are your tab provider. They are available to you to help you understand brownfields, help you figure out how to develop the capacity to assess and clean up, help you think through when and how to apply for a Brownfields grant to use these resources. Uh, next slide, please. And here we go, here's the map, region three, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia, Delaware, Maryland. You are, um, the New Jersey Institute of Technology is available to you to help you with your Brownfields. EPA funds it, it's at no cost to you. We're funding these folks to do good things for you and to provide technical assistance to make use of them. Next slide, please. We also have a really robust land revitalization program to help you think through, okay, I've assessed my property, I've cleaned it up, now what do I do? How do I get it into sustainable use? We have a lot of resources and tools available to you. Please check out our website, but tons of tools, lots of advice, and um, lots of uh, different uh, technical systems and guidance. Next slide, please. And then, after lunch today, you're going to hear a lot of really cool things about our Repairing America's Lands program. Laura Strine of EPA is going to talk to you about this great resource that helps you think through whether your site is amenable to different uh, uh, renewable energy um, options. So um, I don't need to talk about this because Laura's going to go into detail, but just think all the options that helps you think through um, how to do um, renewable energy on brownfields. Good tool, more, more to hear about that later. Next slide. Oh, and the Brownfields Conference, another like great place to learn all about how to do brownfields, how to assess and clean up and network and do wonderful things and make your brownfields work for your communities at the Brownfields Conference. We're currently scheduled to be in Oklahoma City in September, but stay tuned. We're getting nervous about September folks. And so, um, we want to make this the safest conference that we can. Um, I'm not sure if we're all going to be vaccinated and ready to travel in September. We may have to postpone, but remember, we'll be in Oklahoma City, and I really look forward to seeing everyone in person very soon. So more to come on the, on the dates later, um, and uh, we'll be uh, posting updates on our website at www.epa.gov slash Next slide. Is our next slide? That's just our contact information. Remember, as Mead says, you know, if you have questions, you need help, come to us, talk to us, 
call your tab provider, call me, call me, and we'll, um, we're here to help. So Brownfield Solar, the future is bright. Perfect, Patricia. Thank you so much. You, you even stole my teases. Uh, how did you do that? Uh, that? I've never worked with you before. I don't know how. Mm, yeah, Brownfields. We haven't been uh, smashing our heads against the wall uh, with Mead as well, but both of you terrific presentations and I hope everyone can tell um, how seasoned uh, are these redevelopment stars are. They know these programs inside and out. And let me just say as a national practitioner, um, and underscoring something uh, that Patricia said, that Virginia does have some of the best people. Um, we've got great programs, that's what we're talking about, and those are, are easier to replicate, <laughs> but getting to know uh, the, the really good people that the state of Virginia, the Commonwealth has plugged in at DEQ, at DMME, all through, I don't know how they're doing it, uh, but the, the difference is stark. And Mead is, is, of course, one of their leading stars. But also, um, if you're hearing about all this Brownfield stuff for the first time and it sounds too good to be true, I promise it's not. Um, Patricia said maybe the quote of the morning, uh, Congress had an epiphany. And uh, we're just fortunate that Brownfields has been one of, the, one of these places where Republicans, Democrats, everyone understands um, the need for kind of public sector involvement and the focus on these local level projects. It's kind of the perfect thing. And um, the way that these programs are organized, uh, they're very structural, there's objective criteria, they're ranked as Patricia was saying, you know, you, you can't fake the funk uh, on these projects. You, you've got to come strong. If, you don't, if you're not a nerd like me, you better have a nerd on your team. Um, and that's how uh, we're able to raise the minimum, you know, get people really thinking about these issues as they apply for their grants right from the start and, uh, and then follow through. So I'm, I'm uh, eating up our time, but, uh, and, and we're in kind of a lunch hour, we're gonna have a nice break, but do you guys, I wanna give you guys an opportunity for some final thoughts. Um, we're gonna take some kind of questions later in the day. Uh, we're gonna come back, we're gonna answer some of the questions that we snagged from the chat, but, uh, but me, do you have a, a, a final thought? Um. Yeah, engage us, engage us early. Uh, you know, it, it makes a lot more sense to work through problems early on than to uh, call us at the last minute when there's a closing next week or tomorrow and trying to uh, solve a problem that it took decades to manifest. So get with us, uh, get with, you know, we, we engage with EPA. Uh, Patricia and her team are great people. Region 3, we work very closely with. Uh, as Patricia mentioned, we get some really great grants from EPA, uh, three different types is, is what Virginia has tapped into, and it's been a powerful tool, as you can see, that we've coupled with the VBAF grant. So, and I, I really appreciate Patricia joining us. It's, it's always great to get OBLR. I've worked closely with them over the years, and uh, they're just, it's a stellar team up there. Cosine. That's neat. Patricia, any final uh, final thoughts for us? No, other than just to say that, you know, it's a lot to throw at you, like to talk about money and it's funding, it's available. And, um, but remember the Brown, the EPA Brownfields program, our grant cycle basically starts in September, but please don't wait till September to, you know, you're thinking about it now. Look at our grant guidelines for this year. We don't change our grant line, guidelines very much from year to year. So get, a, get an idea of what you will have to do to apply for a grant now. And if it seems overwhelming, call me, call me, call your TAB grantee, call your, your Brownfields coordinator at Region 3, Michael Torino, he's available. So we're all available to help you out and take, uh, take advantage of all the resources that we have, but don't wait till the last minute because it's a competitive program. We only, only about a third of the folks that apply for grants each year actually get grants and basically, if you're the better prepared you are, the more of a chance that you have. So be prepared and be, ask questions. Be prepared, ask questions. This is the perfect place I wanted to leave it. It's as Mead said, the closing table is not the place for these kind of big reveals. And it's really a, a, a nice underscore to the entire morning. Um, I've been all sunshine and unicorns. Um, but this is sophisticated stuff. We know how to do it. We have the tools, we have the programs, we have best practices, but you actually have to do the work and you have to start early for all kinds of reasons. Engage your community early, start your diligence early, start asking questions early, start exploring variable programs early and who can help you. Call Gary White at NJIT. He will answer your questions for free. Thank you, Congress. 
but you got to do it early. Um, you, you, you really can't uh, turn in your assignments late on this stuff because it is a boom. It is a renaissance. These are competitive programs. As Patricia just said, the EPA Brownfield program is so successful, it's 300% overscribed on average. And as Virginia starts to build a parallel program on the Brightfield side for DMME to administer, I'm sure, this, this is me forecasting, that that program will be oversubscribed in its first round and probably ever after. Um, so we got to get to work. We got to get to work now. And uh, we already are. If you're still watching us right now, you're, you're in the Army and, uh, and the Renaissance is, is growing. We're going to be distributing all the, the materials that you need uh, to, go, to go home and start your homework um, next week in the, in the big knowledge binder. Keep asking those questions. We're over time. We're going to take a hard break now. We're going to stop the stream so you can eat and replenish yourselves, do a lap around the block, call, call somebody, whatever you need to do. Um, we're going to come back. Patricia stole my tease, but we're coming back with even more great government programs and available resources that are available online for free, a partnership between EPA and DOE, which again, somehow our government was thinking ahead in this space <laughs> and has been working for years uh, with great professionals attached to, to nurture this renaissance. And with that, I'll wrap. We'll come back at the top of the hour. And uh, thank you. The future is very bright. Thank you.